draw in a few peeps who are hello here we go i've got maureen blanford joining me today on enterprise hits and misses video how you doing i am happy to be here and we are going to blow some things up today just like you have blown up my twitter timeline on many occasions with salty tweets about where we are going wrong in in b2b uh, yeah, happy to do that anytime. <laughs> yeah, and and for those of you who are watching, we've got a classic countdown show prepared today. Marine is going to the buzzword allergic. Marine Blanford is going to walk us through why we can't transform or compete. That that should be pretty fun, and and how to get off Legacy Mountain, which doesn't sound like a very fun place to be at all. Marine, right? We want to get off Legacy Mountain, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and Maureen and I, I was in my promo, I said, we've never met. And then you're like, yes, we have, we did meet, we met once, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that we didn't really meet because it wasn't like the kind of genuine conversation we're having today. So hopefully you can let me slide in that technicality. So, and also you have no recollection of it. So I'll let you slide on that. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Greg, I'm sorry you're having trouble uh, with, with the LinkedIn thing. I don't know, man. We'll have to troubleshoot that a little bit later. I can't worry about that right now when I'm on the air, but hopefully you can see it one way or the other or catch the replay. Uh, and uh, so, Maureen, you got a lot going on right now. Uh, you, you have some shifts in direction with what you're doing, which I want to talk to you about. So before we get to the countdown, I want to really sort of get into sort of what what makes you tick. Um Sort of, how would you describe yourself in, in our world? What role do you want to play in, in the enterprise? Yeah. So, one of the things that has been prevalent throughout my career is is noticing what's wrong, and really like a dog with a bone wanting to fix it. And that uh, was from my early days on. Um, when I my origin story, very briefly, is that I fell into a role with NCR Corporation in Dayton, Ohio, of all places. Um, so this very deep, rich B two B complex sale. Uh, in fact, they invented sales training as we know it today. So early on, I was riding with salespeople and kind of seeing the friction between the field and headquarters. And that has served me throughout my entire career, whether I was on the agency side or the client side. Mm. Technology didn't fix that friction? No, no, it didn't, did it, John? <laughs> <laughs> Maureen, <laughs> come on. <laughs> and and the other thing that really struck me is I when I looked in your background originally and saw you had so much sales and marketing background. But I'm like, you don't really talk like a sales and marketing person. What what happened there? Did you not get the proper indoctrination? <laughs> well, it's funny because I had B2B um, agencies for the first part of my career. And, and marketing leaders were not my clients. They weren't interested in talking to me because I was critical of how marketing was done. You know, so those of you who are around in the 80s and 90s who ever got like a big fat, you know, branding book, that cost hundreds of thousands to produce. And then as soon as the company took, you know, delivery of it, they just did what they wanted to do anyway. And my first book is called um, Branding Doesn't Work in B2B. Um, but I I sold for, you know, I was, I owned an agency and I had to sell. So I sold and, and I love salespeople and I worked with salespeople a lot. And there are a lot of really great salespeople. They get a bad name. Um, but, and my sales training is Sandler. And so I've always tried to do marketing in a way that replicates the great salespeople. So ask more questions, listen more than you talk, um, have their pain in the spotlight rather than you know your feature functions benefits. So that has also been foundational throughout my career, whether I was client side or agency side. And and why why doesn't branding work in B two B? So branding doesn't work in B two B. First of all, we don't teach B2B branding um, at the university level. I think we've maybe started to recently. But all of the stuff that the that the branding folks would would um, focus on, you know, color um, and the photos have to look this way as opposed to that way. All this opinion stuff. Logo redesign. <laughs> the perpetual and, logo redesign. Yes, and so that's any, what really influences B2B buyers, right, Maureen? Hundred percent. And so. Any time that that Madison Avenue influenced our marketing counterpoints counterparts in in headquarters to buy these huge branding projects, um, that is not um, in B two B. It's it's 
it's not B2P. Um, you are selling to a business and it's, it's not like buying a carton of milk or some butter on the way home. It's just not. And so that's why we needed a different approach in uh, on the B2B side. Greg, one of our regular uh, viewers, hi, Greg, says technology was a force multiplier in some sales efforts, both positively and negatively. Greg, I think we'll probably revisit that comment as, as we go. Um, Maureen, uh, you, you wrote a book uh, not too long ago that has something of a un, unflattering uh, job title when it comes to thinking about business. What's the moats and drawbridges thing about that? Can you tell us the title and tell us why you decided on that? So it's called Moats and Drawbridges, the, the current state of cross-functional insight sharing in B2B. So it's about how... Are we really that bad? Are we we're really that bad. Yeah, of course we are. I mean, we call, someone along oh the way decided God. that we were going to call groups in companies divisions, like actually divided from each other. Like, how bananas is that? And so one of my issues in sales and marketing is, and I've been on the client side for about eight years, I feel like we're having the exact same conversations today that we had eight years ago. You know, sales accepted leads, what's the conversion rate, speed to lead, all this crazy stuff. Um, and, and while some of it is important and we can, we can cr try to get to some of those answers, there are also a lot of insights. Um, every functional area has insights the other functional areas need. And we're not really sharing today, except for sales and marketing doing their same dance, you know, weekly or monthly or whatever it is. But product has stuff that they could be learning from what marketing is researching in SEO or product could be influencing what marketing is prioritizing in SEO, for instance. Um, and we're not doing enough collaborating through those functional areas. And so the book is about how to collaborate better. And I've actually piloted it a couple times with my own organizations. But then it's also about how we can start to structure some of the unstructured uh, insights that are happening, like that sales and success would be hearing when they're talking directly to prospects and customers. And the book is is free and it goes into a lot more detail, but I could talk all day about that. One thing I notice about you is that you're a lot more outspoken than what I associate with a typical sales or marketing person. Do you ever worry that that's going to like cost you business? Because I think a lot of people are kind of holding back. Yeah, you know, I... I, one of the reasons why I launched my new venture um, is because while I've been on the client side, I've certainly had bosses who um, I've not been curtailed that I remember, but I've certainly curtailed myself, although that's mm. hard to believe. Um, but there are things that you can't say while you're employed by someone else. Um, and while, you know, just for instance, while Salesforce is a lovely company and Benioff, I think, does a lot of good in the world, um, they're also crap and have caused a lot of issues. And that's not something you can say while you're employed by somebody else, for instance. Mm, right. Yes, well, that that kind of gives folks a flavor of of Marine uh, Unleashed as you're currently going by on on LinkedIn. Uh, Greg, I think, has a buzzword related question for us. He says he, I thought SI provided the holistic insight integration with a value based flavor and a key link to greater billable hours for the SI. L O L, yeah. Uh, you've, so you've met some SIs. Yeah, Same. Greg. Greg, Greg, Greg has managed a lot of large scale projects, so he he's sort of buzzword allergic as well at this point. So you guys don't need immunization from buzzwords. You already have it. Um, you, you sent me a, a tweet a while ago that I included in an article about B2B buyer trust. Yes. And your tweet was, hi, tech co's buyer here. Guess what's more important to me than price integration. Duh. Two, you're humans after the sale. And then you went on to say, if you can prove to me that your success team is better than your competitors, that will win me over versus any other buying criteria. I thought that was really interesting. Like this notion that, that, that customer success and my confidence in your ability to provide that for me, that's a relationship based and a metrics based thing. It's got friggin' nothing to do with logos and branding. And anyway, I just thought that was very interesting. Well, and since I talk about productivity debt a lot as a marketing leader over the years, I have noticed just in the marketing stack um, and a little bit of the sales stack alone, the productivity suck 
um, that happens time and time again in the workarounds that we're forced to do. And I know that this has to be true in other functional areas as well, because I've talked to them. So HR has these issues and sales has these issues. But the productivity suck um, that happens when stuff doesn't integrate and you and you buy tech and the vendors have made promises. And then after you've bought it and you're implementing and there are problems, most of the vendors don't have any humans that are left for you to talk to to help you solve for that. So as a marketing team, um, I speak at a lot of marketing conferences where it's like, you know, you have to hear all the time from the market, like, why don't marketers get data if they just understood data? It's like marketers get data, but but so many times during the day, they're cobbling shite together and putting it in Excel or this one doesn't talk to that one. It's workaround management um, in tech because of these integration issues. And, and so that's why um, I would prioritize as a marketing leader making a tech solution purchase um, where I knew I was going to get humans uh, in the loop after the sale versus one that was prettier, had a few more cool features. It's mm-hmm. really costly. You got a new fan, spectacular subtlety in this Marine person, <laughs> much admiration. Although Greg, her Twitter feed's not all that subtle and she just said the word shite. So I think we're going back and forth between subtlety and, and, and brazen opinions. But <laughs> and, and, and so this is sort of, I think, sort of one of the keys to understanding how you tick, Maureen, is that you, you've you worked a lot on the agency side. And in fact, now you're back on the agency side, which is part of what you're rolling out and announcing right now. And you have more announcement video coming on that. But you've also worked inside of companies for a number of years. And it seems to me that that, while that may not have always been fun for you, I think that also sharpened your understanding of how the clash we have between marketers, tech promises and reality, would that be fair? Totally fair. It's um, so I've had on the client side, I've been in four companies in four countries in the last eight years, um, you know, small to medium and larger. And yes, yeah, so as a as a purchaser, a buyer and internal influencer of software purchases, I've certainly um, felt that pain. Um, in fact, on that same tweet thread, or I'll, I'll never forget this because I also I also quote him as well. Um, Matt Assay, who is with um, AWS, uh, responded to that where he said it's always been about the people because he said um, all enterprise software sucks, yours sucks, your competitor sucks, and the only thing that makes it better are the people who who stay involved. Um, and so I think there are a lot of us really in, in, in pain out there. And I keep wishing, I blame it on the tech founder ecosystem because they just bloviate so much and suck up all the oxygen because they have a, cool, a few cool features. Um, but the rest of it is, is really junk. And I wish we'd be investing more in the, in the tech that we have rather than throwing so much money in, in this new tech that's just going to add the Legacy Mountain further on down. We're going to talk about Legacy Mountain in just a minute, but... First, we got to go through a few comments. Dan Howitt. Hey, Dan. Aw, hey, Dan. He's, he's got some uh, back to his grievances with Excel. Uh, uh, he's also asking if I got a haircut. No, Dan, I did not. My hair is <laughs> unbelievably long. Popular I just have, topic. Currently have, currently have no plans to cut it at the moment, but we'll probably before I get on planes, I will just for the hassle of it. Uh, David wants to point out that you went to the trouble of putting the E on shite. What more do I want? Yeah, well, fair enough. Uh, I told Maureen she could swear on the show, but you know we'll just have to play that by ear. Uh, and Greg has more um, marketing uh, buzzwords for us to digest later. But Thomas' question I was saving for the end here. Uh, he he is uh, trying to find the weak points in our arguments, which is good. So Thomas says, somewhat pulling the chains, but aren't the biz departments predominantly marketing and sales that implemented point solutions largely responsible for the integration nightmare? Maureen. So a hundred flipping percent. I'm trying really hard not to be a cusser. Um, but so here's here is my bandstand there. The foundational tech does not work as advertised, largely looking at Salesforce and pretty much every marketing auto- automation platform out there. So what's happened is all of these point solutions, you know, Scott Brinker's, you know, 8,000 MarTech landscape, all of that stuff is what I call Band-Aid tech. So it's meant to fix an integration error that, that, that you know, largely um, should be addressed in the foundational tech. And then that causes integration errors with something else and so on and so on and so on. Um, and that's my view in particular of the MarTech landscape is it's, it's, it's Band-Aid tech rather than 
and and I, I guess point solutions are band-aid tech, but does that answer your question? I because I'm totally with you there. Keep it coming, Thomas. <laughs> Den, Den, Den says, here's the issue. Firms need to sell solutions, not yes. tech. It should be table stakes, but yes. will require firing most sales teams, <laughs> as I'm seeing in a few forms. Uh, and product marketing and product. And um, yeah, the, I, 100%. And, and how many decades have we been talking about we need to be selling solutions and not features and functions or tech? And yet, um, it's one of the things I do, and I've done this just for funsies, is I'll is I'll lay out, um, and I've recently done this with, with a with a large global CRM manufacturer. You lay out their messaging, you know, from from above the funnel to hand over to sales, and boy, it's it's not solution based mes- messaging. It's all about them. I mean, in B two B, I've been doing this for thirty years. Um, so you can do the math. Um, it's we've been talking the same thing. You can't sell feature functions benefits. We need to be selling solutions, and we're we're bad at that. Yeah, you take the band aid tech, Greg. I mean, it's Greg it's, says band aid tech uh-huh. stealing that for use in every in every upcoming meeting. But it is next and it sucks. week. Ouch. Yep, that doesn't bode well for our futuristic next gen enterprise, does it? Um, Thomas says, given that a good platform supports around eighty percent of the necessary wanted solutions. The problem rather seems to be a fiefdom rather than a tech one. He's right in Fair your enough. wheelhouse, I think. There, mm-hmm. Fair enough. Yep, absolutely. Um, Den says, a long time, but the pandemic's made this super obvious based on what customers demand. And indeed. Um, yeah, I, I think so. And, you know, one thing I find really interesting, I spent a lot of time on content strategy because obviously that is inherent to Diginomica and I have a whole theory of, attention, which I won't get into today, but it has to do with the fact that I get fed up when B2B firms try to be entertaining and sell a cult to personality because I don't think that's really what moves the needle and it's irritating and annoying. Um, and I like to see B2B being authentic and, 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 and generating helpful communities around what they do and solving real world problems. And so I go to all these like webinars around content and, and what I notice again and again is the webinars are really more about the tools to analyze stuff. And and, and the analytical tools are great. They're all on your 6,000 MarTech slides, right? But they always say content, 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 but they never talk about the fact that most of their content is shit. And so basically, you're measuring crap, you're analyzing crap, and it's crap, and it's not resonating with anyone. And so I think that's one of the interesting problems when you start deconstructing, okay, sales has to change, marketing does too. And that's one of my big beefs is like, yeah, you have all these great tools. You can do all this fancy, you know, multi-level lead attribution schemes, but your content is crap. Sorry. Um, and, oh, am- and your, oh, and your virtual event sucks too. Um, <laughs> because, because as you said this week, virtual events are not just streaming keynotes. <laughs> like, Brilliant. Well, right. That's that's one thing I'm really worried about as as we get back to these. When people talk about hybrid events, they're thinking, oh, yeah, we're going to have a hybrid event. And I know what that means. It means you're going to stream your crappy keynote. And then when the really good sessions start, the people on the ground to get that and you're not going to bother because you have no creative event design skills because you never got off of your brand casting from the beginning. Anyway, it's not my show. It's yours. We got to get back to you. Yeah, they says, do actually. Okay, go ahead with Dan, and then no, I want to you, follow up okay. on that. Dan says, I'm hopeful that an API-based approach works as that's the tech in for solutions where the salespeople are much more consulting with. That makes mm-hmm. sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. Go ahead, Maureen, with your so, comment. So <laughs> the, the content piece, um, w- w- what you were just talking about is the, the challenge is for me in both marketing and sales, we have worshipped too long at the altar of scale and automation and fake personalization. And what's happened, and my and my sales leadership friends out there will, will agree with this, is we've completely forgotten about the message. So I can tell you internally, companies are very, very focused in rolling out these automation tools, and no one is paying attention to the message. And so if the message sucks, as it does, any of us just have to look in our, in our inboxes to see how bad the sales messaging is. And I just wrote a blog called We Have Failed Our Salespeople, because we have, because it makes salespeople look bad. And they've not even written this stuff. The system, marketing and sales enablement and sales leadership sometimes writes all that crap. Um, so we are just, we have we have lost the thread uh, entirely and need to start looking more at the message before we look at what we're scaling. So mm-hmm. you're right. 
Yeah, De- Den's trying to bring me down to earth here by saying mar- marketing is rooted in a hundred year old models. So how could you expect <laughs> content to be anything other than crap? Well, I don't know, Den. It's just that occasionally I get my hopes up and I and then I get my heart broken again. I'm I'm a fool that way. I should just be a cynic. But um, but but you know, I have part of it too is that I have attended some really incredible events yes. this year that I thought were transformative and interesting and powerful. It was very rare. Um, but when it did happen, it was like light bulbs going off all over the place. And I was like, well, why aren't more people doing it? Um, anyway, um, the message Dem, part is hard. Dem wants to know how you get marketing on board, which is a trick, right? Because if you just talk trash them, like I just did, that's not exactly going to win them over. So it's a, it's a fair point. Yeah. It's so, so there are lots of ways. There are some organizations that are that are really focused on on that qualitative side. There are some great vendors out there. I hope to evangelize um, some of what I've done as a marketing leader um, because I can because I can prove that if you get the if you get the message right and you pay attention to that, um, the the data is is pretty compelling. All right, so we're going to get into our countdowns in a bit. I'm really looking forward to this, but before we do. I do want to try to try to nail you down a little bit on this term legacy mountain, because we're going to talk about how to get off this and legacy mountain doesn't sound like a really nice mountain to me. It doesn't sound like, like it's going to have a lot of scenic views and cool running water. It sounds kind of like a barren horrid place, but t- tell me what, it, what do you, th- when you define legacy mountain, how do you define it? When you see a customer, an enterprise that's stuck there, what, what are the characteristics of that? Well, you know, from a from a theoretic um, perspective, I think of it as like a trash heap that's just become a mountain. Um, and when I started uh, working with this term, it was several years ago, and I was with a with a professional services organization in Amsterdam um, that did source code analysis. Um, and that's actually when I first started working with Diane Hinchcliffe. And so Diane. Um, t- it takes the term and gives me credit for it, but he thinks of it more as an iceberg. Um, so it, and then the other piece for me is that I've learned so much from, from the CIO and transformation space and pretty much every trend that is going on in the CIO world, um, whether it's um, whether it's software dev stuff or agile or, or any of those things, all of those frames for me work for every functional area. So it's really, it's all of the legacy. For me, it's not just the legacy tech. It's not just the legacy pieces of looking at your IT infrastructure if you're a large company and, and you know that half of it is bad, but you can't um, but you can't unplug one thing because you might break something else, you know, like that. Um, but for me, it's legacy structures and legacy processes and legacy mindsets. Um, so expanding just from what the CIO is 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 troubled by and looking at the organization and expanding out what legacy is. And if you think about, was it Forrester four or five years ago said um, 87% of a CIO's budget was just tied up in keeping the lights on? Um, so what did that other 13% go to? So I think of that 87% as Legacy Mountain. I don't know how far we've advanced from when Forrester came out with that research. You you probably know. But even if it's like 75% is just keeping the lights on, that's still pretty pathetic, isn't it? Not yeah, sure that answered th- your question. No, I think that's good. And I think it's interesting because the technology gets more and more modern and easier to use and better but it, it has a way of exposing all the other things that aren't working as well, right? Um, so we, we just had one of our partners send in a draft for an article about more flexible planning because obviously one of the things in the pandemic is that, uh, especially CFOs, but a lot of different executives have realized our planning scenarios have been terrible. Some of them had to revert to spreadsheets because their planning tools suck so much. So that, okay, well, let's get this modern planning tool in. Well, great, but just because you have a modern planning tool in, let's say that it does incorporate external data sources that you need, just because you have that doesn't mean you're going to make better decisions or be more collaborative. So I think it's interesting how even as the tech gets better, it just exposes the rest of what you're describing. So maybe the, maybe the tip of the iceberg looks pretty in the ocean, but man, it's a beast if you slam into it. Absolutely. And it's, and it's stunning to me how much you know Excel has its purposes, and Excel is a fine tool and whatever. But if there's if there is an enterprise wide tool today, not naming any names because there's plenty of them to look at. If you've got an enterprise tool today that a company has invested millions and millions in, and you're pulling data out to manipulate it in Excel, and then you're shoving it back in the tool, like what is up with that? 
Right. So let's start this the first countdown. The first countdown is usually pretty snarky, so this one will be too. <laughs> um, you you have come up with a countdown for us on uh, why you can't transform or compete. So that's that's pretty tough, love. And and you weren't able to, able to narrow it to five, but I'm going to let you do all all seven <gasps> if you'd like. Okay, I was so, going to smush six and seven together no, just I'm not to gonna, try to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to make you do that. Um, but what I will do is just kick us off. Pick pick the one you want to start with there. Okay. Well, I'm going to start with the with the harshest one, and that is that your your C suite and and your board either don't care or they don't know enough about technical debt and productivity debt. And for me, this is unforgivable because those two things are strangling organizations and there's so much information about it in the market that it really is, it's it's shameful um, that that is not getting more attention. And, and what that means is you have very expensive people throughout your organization who are cobbling together data um, and what does that cost? Those expensive people cobbling together the data. But for me, what gets me even more is these are expensive people and they're probably pretty intelligent. What are they not doing strategically while their hands are tied with that stuff? Like this one just hacks me off. So that's the first reason why companies can't transform. All right, let's do another. Second law of thermodynamics. And you have to promise me now that we're going to be lifelong friends, that you'll never ask me anything else about thermodynamics, okay? Because I won't okay. be able to talk to you about it. As long but as we discuss, stick with the second law, we're okay. <laughs> second law, we're okay. okay. So second reason why you can't transform, and if you can't transform, you can't compete, is I love the second law of thermodynamics, which means that uh, a closed organization cannot take on new energy, which I think about as change. So they can't take on ch new change, new programs, new change agents. Um, and we know that closed organizations, what happens to them, if you can't take on new energy, entropy ensues and only ever gets worse. So chaos disorganization ensues, only ever gets worse. And if you've worked at an organization like this, that is the second law of thermodynamics in action. This one's forgivable because we don't really talk about this in the market, although hopefully we will more. Indeed. Uh, we have some good chat things going on regarding Excellent. the stubbornness of Excel. Uh, oh, and and by the way, uh, uh, Esteban, uh, I can't actually see your comments in, in my stream, so don't think I'm ignoring you. It's just got to do with your LinkedIn settings. No problems. You can have whatever settings you want. Just wanted you to know I can't look actually... Look forward to seeing those. I can't see your stuff now, but I will look at it later. Uh Dennis says he's been on a rant on spreadsheets since 1996, failed to get enough people to buy in to make a difference despite numerous documented failures. So there yeah. you go. I mean, God, the spreadsheets are going to kill us. Greg says both productivity debt and technical debt is often purposely obscured throughout enterprise at all levels up to the top. Purposefully obscured. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about it from that angle. Before. Greg, feel free to feel free to elaborate on purposely obscured. Do you want to talk just briefly about productivity debt? I think most of us in the chat probably know what technical debt is. What do you view as productivity debt? So I think of productivity debt as 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 a bit of a mirror um, to technical debt. Um, so productivity debt is what do all the workarounds cost us? Um, again, as marketers, we take a lot of shit in the market for not understanding this or not understanding that. But really, I've seen time and time again and talk to marketers all the time, marketing leaders, actual marketers. Um, about the time wasted uh, to get workarounds done, um, the 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 things that you have to give up because you're doing the workarounds, and that's either you're doing this workaround so that thing's not getting done, or this thing that you'd really like to do requires such a workaround you can't do it, so you have to give up on this end thing here because you've got other priorities. So that's what I think of as pro productivity debt. All right. <laughs> Let's continue with our countdown on why you can't transform or compete. What's next? Okay. So these next two, three and four, I am not the originator of, but I love them. So um, we're still not seeing in the field by and large, any kind of sensible transformation request from C-suites or boards. Um, so they're neither asking for them 
um, or requiring them. Um, and, and this could be the board directive to the CEO. It could be the CEO working with the functional area leaders. The functional area leaders are certainly not, this isn't everyone. The folks who are transforming obviously have this in place, but the lion's share of organizations aren't hearing this. Um, and I know that this is something that 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 y'all in the CIO and the transformation space have been talk, talking about for a while. Do, do boards and C-suites have the skills needed to actually lead? Absolutely. Uh, David, uh, you, you copied and pasted a comment from Esteban, but I'm, I'm not going to read it just because I want to respect the fact that I can't see Esteban's comments and unless Esteban says it's okay for that to be copied and pasted, I'm just going to let it sit on LinkedIn um, just out of respect for whatever settings he may have in place. Uh, Den says, uh, Betty in the corner is the most valuable person in the firm. Ooh, I guess I lost Maureen for a sec. She'll probably be back though. All right, well, we'll let's wait for Maureen to log back on. Uh, I will shoot shoot the crap with uh, with the chatters here. Yeah, I, Betty in the corner is an interesting one. I saw. Um, oh, here's Maureen again. Oh, she's back. No idea. Welcome back. Thank you. Who knows what happened? Glad to have you back, though. <laughs> De- we didn't miss anything. Betty um, in the corner. Betty in the corner is the most valuable person in the firm. Yeah, I, I think. You know, Den's talking about the fact that a lot of the people with the most institutional knowledge often really aren't high in the hierarchy. And it's interesting how so few tools have really been designed to serve those types of people. Um, I I ran into one BI vendor about two years ago. um, And I'm not going to say which one because I don't want this to be a vendor plug. But it it was an easy enough tool to use that that the so-called secretary in the firm who actually understood the business better than anyone else had designed all these amazing dashboards and all this stuff because you didn't have to use it. Right. But too often, I think in legacy mountain, you, you still have to use it or you have to have your line of business, give you permission to do stuff. You can't just go do it. Right. And so, so the Betty's their institutional knowledge is never captured, but that's a whole nother. Oh, and they're saying that you got kicked out because of your tech debt. Ouch. <laughs> Hilarious. Okay. I love that. <laughs> okay, so we have permission from Esteban to use his comment. So if anyone sees a comment by Esteban that you think I should be aware of right now, just copy and paste it. Thank you. And on we go. You have another one for us. What's next? Yes. So functional area leaders. Um, so number four, why you can't transform, you can't compete. Functional area leaders are not being proactive in their own transformation plans. Um, and I can attest as a functional area leader that this it is hard to do when you don't have a directive from the C-suite because you know, the jobs are crazy. Um, It hasn't been prioritized as a key initiative. They're also, functional area leaders are also drowning in legacy. And functional area leaders are also part and parcel of what's going on with the second law of thermodynamics. Like it is hard to lead change as an individual. That's that's one of the reasons why that's got to come from the top. So fourth reason is functional area leaders are not proactive. Can they be proactive? I'm not sure. Um, but it's tough to lead change. Yeah, right. I mean, it, it's interesting how playing office politics gets you really far, but 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 risking change risks blowback, and blowback's really unpleasant. It's yeah, it's really unpleasant. And if you're, a, you know, there's been a lot of good stuff written about change agents, and it's you gotta have you gotta have thick skin, and you've got to cheerlead, and you're not going to be everyone's cup of tea, and 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 friction is hard for people, and and I think friction is good. I think it sharpens everyone's saw. Um, collaborating with colleagues, even with a little bit of friction, makes everyone better. Not everyone feels that way. Got it. All right. We are counting down why you can't transform or compete with Marine Blanford. Okay. What's, at, what's next on your hot list here? We're at five and then I'll smush six and seven together. Again, five is not, um, y'all have been talking about this for a while, but CIOs aren't resourced appropriately. So this has been something I think we've been talking about for at least five years. Um, they've been in the spotlight as kind of, we've been focusing on them in transformation, which I'm not sure they ever picked for us to be focusing on them, but still, whether they should be leading it or not, um, as organizations, we need to be resourcing our, our digital infrastructure appropriately. So, so we need to be working together to make sure that that functional area is resourced appropriately. And, and it's still not, and you all could speak to that better than I could, but agree, disagree? 
All right. The CIO has been in the transformation spotlight for five years, yet little to show. Ouch. That hurts. Well, I would say as organizations, we have little to show. I don't know that that's the, that the, that's the CIO's fault. I mean, we've been making bad decision after bad decision, enterprise-wide. And so, CIOs yeah. often report into the CIO. <laughs> Ouch. Uh, wow. Um, it's We're going to have to dig ourselves out. And I promise you folks that we are going to do it because this show is not uh, just a water cooler gripe session. We are going to press Marine for answers. But part of my view for the show and the enterprise in general is not only to have a little little fun at the enterprise's expense, but to lay out the problem in a more in a more unsparing way than we usually do. So we're going to keep going with that for a little while longer. Uh, you you said you want to smush the last two I'll together? Smush, I'll smush the last two together. Okay. So HR and FNA are nowhere near ready for the future of work. As much as the market is talking about the future of work, these are very antiquated organizations who also haven't been resourced appropriately. And the smush piece that I'm going to do is I'm going to say recruitment across the board globally is a nightmare. We do not have systems in place to recruit for the future of work. We have systems in place to recruit for roles that were alive 10 years ago. And, and that, those are my top five, six, seven reasons why you're not transforming. And, and if not, yeah, you can't compete. All right. And uh, pretty soon we're going to do your countdown for how to get out of this mess. And uh, boy, I'm going to be eager to hear that because uh, <laughs> th that may be actually harder than delineating. It's the, hard, man. The, the problem. It's hard. I mean, you guys wrote a great piece uh, a couple years ago, um, Den uh, and Stu. Um, I can't remember who wrote what, but, but about Sage and about um, BT and their failed transformation efforts. And those were, I mean, they were spot on and, and we're still struggling with, with those same issues today. Yeah, absolutely. And Hey, David, thanks for the copy paste on Esteban. It, it looks like I'm now seeing Esteban's comments anonymously as LinkedIn users. So we, we have a few that are anonymous, so I may confuse people occasionally, but, um, but thank you for that. And let's see. Uh, Greg says he was just getting ready to ask if you saw a difference between backend players like HRFI, HR Finance, then you mentioned it. So pretty much, well, I think in the, and in, in, isn't that really one theme is that no one wants to be a back office player anymore? I mean, in, in theory, you want to have a seat at the transformation table, not at the uh, let's automate the heck out of what you're doing table. Yes. And those two have um, so much. HR and finance have so much value to offer, but they've got to have agency. They've got to have room to, um, you know, while, while doing all the protection stuff, they've got to have room to, to fail a little bit as well. I'm not the person who can, can set that structure um, and I'm not an expert there, but I know they're important in the conversation, uh, but someone's got to be looking at that. And I think that probably should be the CEO. I like Esteban's comment here. It's like putting your mechanic in charge of driving your kids to school because he knows about cars. Just because tech is part of the transformation doesn't mean IT has to. A hundred percent. Yes, I I have no I I mean, yes, the 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 CEO should be leading it and should be getting input from everybody, well thought out input and merging it and you know, yes, a hundred percent agree. Den is continuing on with his theme around the institutional knowledge among senior people is being lost at a terrifying rate. Um, Den, I'm curious uh, if, as we move into the solutions <laughs> section of this discussion, if you have any ideas for what, what you think should be done about that. And, uh, and uh, I, I'm not talking about some kind of tech knowledge capture tool either, though. Who knows? Maybe, maybe there's something there, but I don't think that's what you're getting at. <laughs> Funny feeling. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I want to shift gears a little bit. Uh, Maureen here. Now, before we get into your rebuild, just want to talk a little bit about your sort of decision because you, you've gone through a pretty big transition here. You worked for a bunch of client side situations. You dealt with vendors. You dealt with PR. You dealt with all the people from the outside. Now you're kind of emerging again as an agency. What, what do you want to accomplish? Right. So one of the reasons I went to the client side was because uh, I'd spent 20 years as, as agency. I had two different B2B agencies um, and I wanted to kind of harness all of my energy kind of enterprise wide, no matter the size of the company in one company. 
Uh, and now it's kind of the opposite. Why I, why I want to go back out onto the agency side is because I want to do more good um, for as many companies really as I possibly can. And I mean that sincerely. I, I, I love this work. Um, I feel for the people involved. I think some of the solutions are actually easier um, than we think. Um, and I think the biggest obstacle that I've seen that I want to solve for are, are most of the obstacles to transformation or where companies are stuck is because we're not managing the people and the, the communication side. I, I don't want to solve for, I mean, I'm sure I will at some point, but we've got plenty of great end state um, uh, solutions and frameworks for where companies should be. But the problem is they can't get there because of all of this muck that they're mired in. And I want to help with the muck. Yeah, I think one really interesting thing about that is one of the most compelling, I'm not a buzzword guy. In fact, I have this uh, thing. If I use buzzwords too much, I have to go. That is bullshit. Um, so, <laughs> but, but the one thing I buy into a little bit is this notion of continuous, right? So put continuous in front of something and it resonates with me a little bit. Like, And not to say do it all the time, but instead of doing a performance review, once a year, shouldn't that feedback loop be more continuous instead of closing the books yes. or whatever once per however, it's more continuous. The point being like, there's all kinds of reasons why you want to plan more continuously. You know, it all makes sense, right? And, and, and the tech isn't quite there for a lot of that stuff, but it's getting better. But, but then the problem becomes when you talk about that stuff and you talk about it with customers who are buried in their real world problems now more than ever, their eyes really glaze over, right? It's too far beyond their reach. Vendors find it liberating and exciting. And, oh, we're going to make it even faster by slathering some AI on top of it to make it all intelligent for you so you don't have to move a muscle. But, of course, companies really want to understand the how, right? They want to understand what is my next step. Like, I'm still in the swamp here. You know, I'm in the muck. Like, I, I can't just suddenly have wings. Like, I have to, I need to, and, and, and I think that's where we've all fallen short, which is why I'm glad you're trying to do what you're doing. Is because we need to, we need those next steps. the The vision's great; we can all buy into it. But 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 getting there is a whole other thing. Absolutely. And as someone made a comment earlier, people want to do good work. You know, by and large, they want to do good work. They don't want to they don't want to be doing shitty stuff, and they don't want to be one of fifty people in a spreadsheet that's due tomorrow that gets broken. And like, no one wants to be doing that. Um, you know, most people that have 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 good intent at heart, and and this is where for me that's why the 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 number one reason why you can't transform um, is because the C-suite either doesn't care or they're not aware of of how this is strangling their organizations. They're the one who are who are making everybody work with this bad tech, not address it, and then have to be in spreadsheets. And I'm using that as kind of just a, a frame um, for, for, for the kind of work that's going on in larger organizations. Meg's, Meg Bear says, regular feedback. It's not just a process, it's a cultural yes. opportunity. Yeah, yes. So. And uh, Ben says he wants to share his knowledge with the next generation, so he talks to schools. It's cool because uh, when, when Den talks about his quote-unquote retirement, and people say, what is Den going to do? I'm always like, I'm not sure, but I hope he becomes a renegade professor because I love the idea of, of kids coming into class and getting their minds blown by whatever he has to say. Yes. I just think that'd be fantastic. Amen. That's a little bit of a side topic. Lean practices and knowledge work or a potential path to a continuous flow of information. Yeah, absolutely, Greg. And you know, and it's interesting too. There's a whole um a whole um different kind of discussion to have around the future of education. I just wrote a piece on Diginomica. If you want to consider it a shameless plug, sorry. It's about Colby College and how they're integrating AI into their liberal arts curriculum. But a lot of it is about this notion of how education needs to change. And I think we could have a whole important show on that topic. Maybe I'll do that soon. Um, and looks like, oh, Esteban, I can see your name now. Respectfully, Maureen, some people do just want to check in no, no evolution. Oh. Most companies <sighs> have 30 to 40% of these. Ugh. Well, and Maureen, you know the Fair, thing about I'll that? I'll take that. <laughs> You know, the thing about that is that what you and I were talking about before we came on is how with your kind of strong convictions and message, there are going to be some companies that don't want to don't want to work with you as a result right. of that, right? Because right. If, if that 30 or 40% is more like 70 or 80 or 90, they're walking away. But hopefully you can away. find hopefully you can find those that have an appetite. Like that's the beauty of a strong message, right? 
is that it resonates with the people that that you want it to, the real change agents, so to speak. It does. And being, being open to smart people checking you like Esteban just did. And I already love Esteban because I know Nicole France is such a fan. Um, But it's, it's good to, you know, it's fun to pontificate. And it's also great when people are like, Hey, there's some data Maureen that says otherwise, you know, which is like, good point. Yes. All right. Now let's let's go into your inspiring countdown on how to get off Legacy Mountain because I don't think we want to want to live here anymore. Um, so so yeah. <laughs> walk us through this. Okay, so so hopefully inspiring. Um, so one of the one of the examples I'll share in the different transformations. Wait, before you go, I just mm-hmm. want to can I read can I read the thing you sent to me about that about the morons? Did what I send that? you something where I said morons? Yeah, uh, can I read that? Um, or will that sure. get us into trouble? I don't remember saying it, but go ahead. Okay, this is the in, this is the drum roll to Maureen's <laughs> inspiring countdown. Just to be nice to the universe, I will be sharing how they can get the feck off Legacy Mountain if they want to stop being morons and actually respect the fiduciary responsibility they have to their own companies. Wow. I thought that was a perfect intro. Okay. So, all right. So here we go. Wow. See. I was like, I didn't remember saying all of that. Um, so anyway, so the first thing is is recognizing and destructuring the obstacles. Again, like technical debt um, and, and building a, a healthy tech infrastructure, we always have to be aware of what we're doing that's just going to add more legacy. So I just, I love almost every tech frame that comes out. So it's recognize the obstacles and have a plan to destructure those. And I don't just mean in the non-tech world of like the, do we replatform? Do we rip and replace? Do we, but, but, but some of those are helpful. Um, and I think if we don't look at those moving in, and that's a communications thing with people, um, then then we're just going to keep adding more productivity debt legacy on top of it. So recognize the obstacles, destructure them. Identify the right socio-technical structure to achieve your modernized strategic objectives. So I'm a huge fan of the socio and technical. Um, again, it's a dev, you know, it's big in the dev space. Um, but if we're not doing the, the people and the tech, this is where I think we fail um, is because I'll, I'll say it this way. We have really smart tech people internal at organizations. We do. And maybe there's some percentage that isn't. But we have really, really smart people. Um, but they're smart about the tech and the architecture and the mapping and the migrations. What they're not smart about because they ha- they don't have the experience. Because if you're an internal at a company, how many times have you done transformation? Like you're just not going to have that much experience. Um, but like Adam that you had on your show a couple of weeks ago, John was talking about this. Um, what we need is people to help communicate out to the masses what's going to be happening, what it's going to happen in a way that the people care about, not just the time frame for the roadmap, but how is this going to impact you? And here's where we go wrong. So I'm going to give you a cuckoo bananas example, but it's 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 the best one I can say for the things I've seen. So here's what happens when you're dealing with internal folks. So the internal folks could have great plan in place that all of you would look at and be like, yep, that's the right plan. Looks good. I might do that differently. I might do that, but, but sound plan. And then you have an exec So the CEO or an MD or an EVP or somebody like that goes like, yeah, this is great, but um, what about the cotton candy on puppies? We absolutely need cotton candy on puppies because we need to understand how the partner channel is performing and we've always done it with cotton candy on puppies and so we need that. And your internal folks are going to push back once on that and then the the exec is going to have a fit and then the internal folks will go like, "Uh, okay, we'll do the cotton candy on the puppies times 500 times. And that's why these things go awry and they get stalled is because just like in sprints or just like in in other places in the company, you have an agreed plan and the execs come in, largely the execs, and muck it up. And folks don't have agency to, to change that. If you have a great partner involved, and a lot of them aren't great, um, and I've worked with a couple great ones, the things that make them great, because, because a lot of them have the same kind of technical knowledge, which is which is deep and, and broad and, and good. But w- what makes the partners great is they've handled the execs enough so that they can say to the exec, okay, so I hear the cotton candy puppies thing, but what I'm hearing is you're not comfortable with how you're monitoring partner performance right now. And the exec's like, yeah, absolutely. And the and the partner or the, you know, the SI partner who's done it a lot is like, great. I got some solutions for you. 
So you kind of, so you derail them. So that was a long, that was a long story. Um, mm. But the socio-technical thing is really ba- great. We've got to manage the humans from every level in these transformations or it's just going to get mucked up. I'm really passionate about that. Yeah, I like that. I, it, it reminds me of some arguments I have with vendors around in, their industry clouds because industry cloud is really cool now. And I keep pressing them to say, well, who are your experts on the ground that really understand that industry that can go into those clients and and talk with them in a human way about what what other people in their industry are doing better than them and why? Um, it's not just some frigging cloud you can roll out that, that suddenly you're overperforming in your industry. Um, we have a couple of relevant comments. David wants to know about a primer for socio tech. Do you have a recommendation for someone who wants to get into that further? Um I don't off the top of my head, but I know a bunch of great sociotech people, so I can get one to you. If you just PM me on LinkedIn or John can give you my email or. Yep. Cool. And David made an interesting point about people who you thought were stuck in the mud can surprise you too. Sometimes it's about harnessing our ideas or seeding our ideas and waiting for them to come up with things. David, feel free to elaborate on that. I think that's an important point as well. 100%. And 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 being open I was in a um, I was in a call recently several months ago so it was in it was in my my last company where one of the really smart folks leading the transformation effort um, said something to the assemble team which was like forty or fifty people said something like okay I'm sure you guys are like sick of hearing X Y and Z but X Y and Z and la 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 and most of the people on the call had no recollection of ever hearing X Y and Z the transformation team had been doing nothing but talking about X, Y, and Z. And so again, that human layer ensuring that we've got someone who's, who's, who's doing good strategic direction on the, on the communications is critical. Right. And uh, I kind of lost this comment because there were a lot coming in, but Esteban a while ago said, you mean like an evangelist Marine (laughs) cough cough. Um, But I guess it's probably a good time for you to comment on the role of, an internal evangelist per se, and whether you think that can be effective. I think it can be hugely effective if that person is aligned to the C-suite. I think if the C-suite isn't switched on about this, I think the transformation project is going to fail whoever's involved. Um, But it would be something where if we've got the, the, the hearts and minds of the C-suite, I'd, I think absolutely. Yes. Event because, and that's, Obviously, a lot of what what I've done internally is helping people feel like um, like they can do it, and and even addressing things like you know what you guys in this process we're going to lose some data, and that's okay, or we're going to leave all the data on the on prem thing or over here on this la la la, um, and you can always access it, and then in two months nobody wants to access it, but that's a, a way of like a human way of managing like the real fears that people have in these processes. I thought we we're going to put it all in a cloud data lake. Sorry. <clears throat> I meant to say cloud data lake. Den, good to see you. Thanks, Hope Den. Your dinner goes well. Thanks for coming <laughs> by. I assume that's where you're headed next later. Uh, David wants to elaborate. What it meant was some people who act as if they never accept change are a lot more amenable if it's change they thought of. So it can be about nurturing yes. those. You know, it's interesting, David, because you brought me into another one of my topics. Marine seems to spark a lot of these for me, but the other one is my issue with design thinking, which is not that I don't think it doesn't work, but very often when I look at how it's been used, people are pulled in, the stakeholders are pulled in too late, and too many initial premises have already been decided by the time the design thinking workshop actually happens. And, And so that's a really good point. I think what David's saying is you bring these people in early, and they feel like they're invested in it, then, then I think you have a whole different level of motivation. Yes. So, and Esteban is agreeing with your C-suite uh, alignment comment. So where are we in our countdown? You have a few more. I've, you know what? I've smushed some together. So let's, I'll just, you know, ensure you're not building new and tractable legacy. Communicate far and wide, often, often, often. Um, and, and to me, big finish, recognize and reward agents of change. Um it's really important. Change agents have a tough role in in these organizations, whether they're whether they're identifying as a change agent or not. Um, but John Hagel writes about the power of pull, um, and and small teams can do a lot here. So I think recognizing the people who are pushing change forward is really important. But communications overall, absolutely. Well, I don't think we got off Legacy Mountain today, but I think. 
at least we have some ideas of of how these different pieces fit together, um, which is a big part of the puzzle. It's yep. going to be interesting to see how you fare. I'll be fascinated to hear the clients that you pick up and what kind of projects you get involved with. I wish you luck in your, you. in your attempt to try to win some more people over. Oh, I do want to ask you about, um, you talked before we went on about co the role of cognitive bias. Can you tell us a little more about this issue? It's interesting because I'm I'm hoping to do a lot of, um, as you might imagine, content about these issues. Um, but one of my former colleagues um, from Amsterdam just uh, triggered me on this, and she's also uh, really big in in doing talks on um, socio technical in in the software dev um, world. But she had actually been interviewed um, for some training she'd been through, and they said, "Why'd you come?" You know, and she was like, "Well, because I'm aware that you know I have I have my own cognitive bias, and I want to make sure that I'm always aware of that and learning new things." And for me, um, I think that's something as people maybe go higher up in organizations, I think they're less aware of the cognitive bias and how that impacts their ability to make a decision. Um, so, so that is something I'm just starting to cook on more and see if there's something we can be helpful. If, if we talk about cognitive bias more, it might, it might take kind of the, the ouch out of people thinking like, is there something I'm missing or, you know, or, or acknowledging that? Yeah. It seems like there's a lot of defensiveness around the topic, right? Because it's hard to acknowledge sometimes that you're seeing the world through a biased lens yourself. Right. You know, it's pretty easy to point fingers at, at AI tools for inherent biases in, in the algorithms, which of course I think is important also, but mm -hmm. pointing fingers at ourselves is probably even, even harder. Well, and it's one of the things that is really important to me to coach teams on. My teams will tell you that I rarely end an email or a meeting without saying, what am I missing? So trying to teach people to open up to, to hearing from colleagues what you're missing, because I'd, I'd rather find out today what I'm missing than eight weeks from now when I'm already shipping something. Um, so I try and model that for my teams, and I and I I want more of us to model that just to make it more and um, to make it less ouchy when someone says, "Hey, did you think of this that maybe you hadn't thought of?" Absolutely. Well, you chatters have taken on a life of your your own today. Done a great job, and uh, one of the Can't cool things see. about one of the cool things about my show is I like I like a crazy wild chat. So you know, it doesn't doesn't matter if they're. Uh, if they're bailing out on our conversation because they're having some really interesting discussions. <laughs> so no, it's really good. But if, if you guys have any final comments for, uh, for Maureen, that'd be great. Cause you probably will wrap up in just a couple of minutes here. So, uh, I, I usually do a couple of little whiff things from my enterprise hits and misses column, because this show is loosely inspired by my column last in my whiff section last week. Uh, I talked about, uh, I'll do a PR one or a marketing one for you, uh, Maureen. Excellent. The ad said low code lets you run with the big dogs. And I, I love that. <laughs> I love that. So I said, well, except when the big dogs are rolling out award-winning CX apps via hundreds of iOS and Android device specific developers. But yeah, other than that, <laughs> so, so much for low code is the great startup leveling mechanism. God. But uh, Good yeah, when, when someone when someone builds beautiful low code apps, let me know. Um, <laughs> let me know. What are those words, God. Let me posted. Yeah, mm -hmm. low code, no code. That's going to solve all these problems, I mean, right? That's yeah. how we're going to get off Legacy Mountain. Why are we talking about that? You know, just crazy. It looks like the cotton candy uh, stuff worked for people. They got into that. So. <laughs> The cotton candy analogy was definitely, definitely a highlight. I mean, it, it is, it is, it is about as cuckoo as other requests that we get from execs in, in, in these types of programs. So. Uh, Greg's asking if you can be referred to as Mo, is that a, is that a nickname that you allow or is um, that... I allow it if it's M O Mo and not M O E Mo, like as in Larry Curlian and I can hear the difference. So just fair warning. Ah, uh, so you can tell when there's a silent. Absolutely. E yes, I can. Yeah. Well, if you guys in, in, enjoyed this show, I definitely recommend tracking Maureen. She's always good for some from salt, salty and insightful um, commentary. And, and thanks for spending so much time delving into what 
we need to fix in B2B because it's so rare to talk to a sales and marketing person who really has, it's like you, you have B2B like deeply ingrained in how you I think, do, which is, which is both wonderful and scary, but, but that's what I live too. So <laughs> anyhow, folks, I've got a really fun show for you again next week. And I'm not going to tell you because that would, that'd be spoiling it for you, but it's going to be a day debut of something, <gasps> something special. Um, but what I will say is I promised that I was going to get the men off the program for a while and, and I'm going to continue with that next week. So, yes. yep. Yep. We're going to get the female talent on the show. It's going to be great. Um, so that's all I'm going to say, but it's going to be a firecracker. So anyhow, I'll catch you guys next Friday. Thanks everyone for showing up and look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks Maureen. Thanks John.